internal medicine physician and the associate medical director for Cedar sinai Medical Care Foundation. In 2013 and 14, I had helped lead a coalition that brought together a dozen of Southern California's largest health systems, hospitals, and medical groups to address the harms caused by poor advanced care planning. Representatives from palliative care and supportive care medicine, ethics, intensive care, and primary care came together and collaboratively forged a forward-thinking statement advocating greater attention to advanced care planning and sensible approaches to end-of-life care. We organized a conference to promote the message and to identify solutions. Yet, even as our health systems represented some 8 million Angelinos, and although we had the backing of our chief executive officers and executives at all of our institutions, we realized that attempting to recalibrate the needle on end-of-life care would itself be futile if the messengers were healthcare systems alone. So our 2014 conference titled Better Planning, Better Care, Promoting Dignity, Reducing Suffering at the End of Life became a partnership between health systems and houses of worship with representatives of the faith community. My home institution, Cedar sinai a leader in the effort to reduce unnecessary suffering at the end of life, was proud to host the conference. And so it is as a physician and as a vocal advocate for shattering taboos around discussing and planning for death, it is my great honor to introduce Dr. Philip Pizzo. Dr. Pizzo's impressive biography is available in part uh, in the documents you received at the beginning of the day today um, and in full on the website. Um, in order to allow as much time for him to speak as possible, and actually at his request, uh, I'm going to just touch on the, a few of the most important of those achievements. Dr. Pizzo is the David and Susan Heckerman Professor and Founding Director of the Stanford Distinguished Careers Institute. He's the immediate past dean of the Stanford School of Medicine. Much of his distinguished medical career has been dedicated to the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of childhood cancers. He's been a leader in academic medicine, championing programs and policies to improve the future of science, education, and healthcare in the United States and beyond. Dr. Pizzo has received numerous awards and honors, among them the Public Health Service Outstanding Service Medal in 1995, the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Award in 2008, and in 2012 he was the recipient of the John Howland Award, which is the highest honor for lifetime achievement bestowed by the American Pediatric Society. He's been elected to a number of prestigious organizations and societies, and I won't detail them all here, um, but uh, Prominent among them is the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, where he was also elected to its governing council. The IOM became the National Academy of Medicine in 2015. He served as chair of Association of Academic Health Centers and chair of the Council of Deans of the Association of Me American Medical Colleges, <clears throat> and was elected to the board of directors of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Dr. Pizzo is the author of more than 600 scientific articles, 16 books and monographs, and he co-led a multidisciplinary committee for the IOM that resulted in the 2011 report, Relieving Pain in America, a Blueprint for Transforming Prevention Care and Education and Research. He also co-chaired the IOM report, Dying in America, Improving Quality and Honoring Individual Preferences at the End of Life, published in 2015. It is the work of this committee that is the subject of his presentation today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pizzo. Well, thank you very much, uh, Justin, for that very kind introduction. It's really an honor to be here with you today and to have a chance to reflect on the work that you're doing and the work that we try to contribute to through the Institute of Medicine. A couple of caveats. I I'm really not an expert on end-of-life care. Um, as you heard, my background is in pediatrics, particularly children with catastrophic disease. And I'll come back to that in a moment as I try and shape a little bit of the context and background for our report. Rather than um, reading and reciting to you all 612 pages of the report, um, how many of you have actually seen parts of the report, just so I know? 
Okay, so I, I don't want to be redundant, and so what I'll try to do is give you a little bit of what has uh, been part of the report and also a little bit of the context and background issues that led to the report, sort of things behind the scenes. Let me kind of set the stage for you uh, a little bit. As you heard, my um, own personal background is in pediatric oncology and infectious disease. And in those capacities, like many of you, I um, share the privilege of caring for, in this case, young people facing life-threatening disease. I started that work at a time when most children died. So I spent a lot of time at the bedside with families um, caring for them before we even thought about hospice care or palliative care as we know it today. And I want to just give you an, a brief example. This is a true story. This happened in one day when I was at the National Institutes of Health uh, where I spent almost 25 years of my professional career. It's an interesting setting, the clinical center at the NIH, because there is no fee for service. Everyone who's working there is salaried and therefore spending her or his time focused on either research or translational clinical activities that improve lives. And I was very privileged to be part of a multidisciplinary team of individuals that included not just physicians, but importantly, maybe even more so, nurses and social workers and psychologists and uh, spiritually oriented individuals who cared for children and families facing life-threatening disease. And one day, right in the early part of the AIDS um, epidemic, when we switched or added to our area of focus children with AIDS in addition to those with cancer, and when pneumocystis carinii was still an important infection in these patients, I had the amazing experience of having two children present the very same day with very severe pulmonary deterioration. And they followed very due pathways. I met with both of the parents and gave them a sense of what I thought the outcome was going to be. And because we always try to allow preference to guide outcome, we gave them a choice about how aggressive we might be in terms of life support systems. And as it turned out, one of the families chose absolute life support. Um, the mother said, I want my child to be on a ventilator if that's what it takes. And the second parent said that they did not. They just wanted comfort care. And tragically, both children died. But what is seared in my mind is the outcome. When the child who was not on life support died, he died in his mother's arms with her holding him close and allowing him to pass um, with all the love and comfort uh, that could exist. In the second case, the child died on the ventilator. And I always remember what the mother said to me after that. She said, if I'd only known that I couldn't speak to my child again and he wouldn't be able to speak to me, I would have never made a choice like that. And that underscores one of the most important issues I think that we all face when we're dealing with the topic of death and dying. It's not just about the person who's dying. It's about the memories, the family, the context that will go on year after year. And I think that has to be a substrate for how we think about our, our approach um, to death and dying. So that's one thread. The second thread, as you heard, I not only had the privilege of serving as an investigator, but spent a fair amount of time also in academic administration, both in Boston at the Children's Hospital and at Stanford. And I recall very well um, when I was dean of the School of Medicine, witnessing the in unfair and in some cases inappropriate decisions of physicians who relegated patients to intensive care settings when there was no prospect for positive outcome with enormous tolls on families and economic tolls as well. So, you know, this is part of the context for your discussions today um, and sort of serves as a framing for what took place through the Institute of Medicine. But it's important to know that the Institute of Medicine report, uh, which followed the 1997 uh, report approaching death, um, was stimulated not 
uh, by altruism, but by political events. I mean, here we are the day before the national elections. And just go back um, for a short time to remember where we were in 2009. 2009 was the early days of thinking about the Affordable Care Act. President Obama had been elected. This was his signature piece of activities. And it was the summer. It was a kind of dry period in the summer when there was a lot of debate going on. The Affordable Care Act had not yet been passed. And two words had an impact on it that was indelible. You all know what they, those two words were, death panels. Death panels. This was the real prescription for what we could look forward to if government became involved in health care. And it changed the whole ledger of the debate in very significant ways, as you all know. But it had a consequence that wasn't anticipated when Sarah Palin echoed those terms. It stimulated an anonymous donor um, just a couple of years later to come forward and say, I think the Institute of Medicine needs to look at this issue again. Now, those of you who know how the Institute of Medicine works, um, you should know that it's a national organization that tries to exercise independence, fierce independence, in really trying to look at issues, examine them carefully, and make sure um, that it's not biased, if you will, by other sources. And there was a lot of concern uh, when an anonymous donor came forward to support um, this committee uh, that uh, led to the report. Questions about well, how could that be? Is that person picking the committee, um, choosing the outcomes? And I want to tell you that one of the most amazing things was that to this day, as co-chair of this committee, I have no idea um, who that anonymous donor was or is. And we had the extraordinary ability to exercise our judgment as we approached um, this challenge. So what happened basically was in the fall of 2012, um, uh, there was a decision that was made to stimulate this committee. Um, Harvey Feinberg, who is president of the Institute of Medicine, uh, asked two people to serve as co-chairs. He asked me to serve as one of the two co-chairs, I think partly because I'd had experience leading other IOM um, committees, and as he put it to me, well, as a dean of a medical school, you'll be able to keep um, this process moving forward. Uh, and he also asked Dave Walker, um, who was the uh, former controller general of the United States, who had an economic background, um, to also serve on the committee. And on the committee, in, in, uh, among its 19 other members, was our own Leonard Schaefer. It was a committee that had a wide array of representation, adult and pediatric care specialists, um, palliative care, hospice care specialists and leaders. Uh, it had clergy, lawyers, people in social work, um, in policy and the law. Many individual opinions. Um, and one of the amazing things that happened at the very beginning of this process was to witness that there was no single point of view. There were many points of view. Um, and there were quite amazing degrees of dissonance between different disciplines. Remembering back to 1997, hospice care was really just getting started. Palliative care as a specialty didn't really exist. Um, and palliative care now, today, is part of the mainstream and became a very important part of the dialogue about what, what should be the future uh, of our work through the report that led to dying in America. Many different constituencies, many different points of view. Um, our committee carried out its work through lots of reading, lots of um, discussions, six formal meetings, but many, many, many discussions behind the scenes. And quite amazingly, despite it all, we were able to reach consensus. Now, we did so by having some things on the table and some things off the table. We started at the very beginning by saying off the table was going to be any discussion about assisted suicide or euthanasia as part of the dying process. It's not 
that this is unimportant. I have my own views about those activities, um, but they're not relevant to the work of the IOM because we found that not to be quite within the scope of activities that we had. And further, we felt that were we to focus on that, it would become the report. And we didn't want that to happen, so we moved that to the side. The second thing is, although, just as you could imagine from the, the co-chairs and a, someone who is thinking about healthcare finance and others who are thinking about healthcare administration, there was a big debate about what was going to be the driver. Was it going to be driven by a need to set priorities and quotas for healthcare delivery? Um, was it going to have an economic uh, factor associated with it? And we basically, although we had some stormy days getting to it, made the decision that we would make that also to the side. We would approach it indirectly. And I'll tell you in a moment how we, um, how we did that. And then we decided to concentrate our recommendations to a very few uh, in number. If you look at other IOM reports, um, they often have 15, 16 recommendations. In the um, report that we did on pain in America, there were 16. We decided to focus on five. And we decided to focus on five because we felt that that would garner the greatest degree of attention. Like I said, it's my own death in America here. Thank you. Maybe that should have come down when I was mentioning Sarah Palin's name. Yeah. So um, we focused on five, and we felt that they were among the most important things that we could um, think about uh, in terms of moving forward. And I want to just go through them with you and give you a little bit of the context for them. The first was on delivery of care. Now, I think it's really important to recognize that what we spoke about in delivery of care is not limited to end-of-life care. In fact, everything is framed in the kind of general, um, rather chaotic healthcare system that we still have in, in this country. We are driven still today while we're in a transition by a fee-for-service model which creates perverse incentives for doing more and getting paid more for doing more as compared to perhaps making the right decisions in terms of what's best for individuals. So one of the things that we recognized is that part of the reason why people get into trouble at end of life is because we have a highly fractured healthcare system with too many providers who don't communicate with each other. And therefore, the wishes and preferences of individuals get lost. And we had as a framing context the view that we were going to focus on quality, and individual preferences, regardless of whether that meant more or less therapy. Coming back to the example that I gave to you, if someone said, we want to get all that we can get in terms of care, we should respect that as much as we can. And if others said, we really don't want to get much more medical care, more social care, we should respect that as well. So the first recommendation was to really foster a seamless, efficient, patient-centric healthcare system that's accessible and available 24-7. So that an individual facing a chronic disease or an end-of-life uh, set of situations would know where to go when they're getting their care. Because think of what happens now. What happens now is if you are in a setting where you have a terminal disease and you don't necessarily have a primary care coordinator, you wind up sometimes getting sent to the emergency department. And when you go to the emergency department, all bets are off. You know, the likelihood that your wishes are going to get honored uh, becomes very unclear. So we felt that this was really important, and we felt that in further officiating this, we would recommend um, that both federal and private healthcare providers would take into their scope of activities the importance of fostering and supporting this kind of comprehensive, seamless healthcare system and pay for those services, both medical and social, um, that allow these processes to unfold in a much more seamless way. We further recognize that 
there is an importance of making sure that among the healthcare providers are experts in palliative care. Now, I think it's important to begin by saying that palliative care comes in basically two categories. There is, if you will, basic palliative care. Our view is that every physician who, or provider who's involved in providing, if you will, end-of-life care should be possessed of those basic skills. The specialty of palliative care, for whom there are still relatively few in number, um, could be available as educators, access points until um, there are more of them. But we'll never, I don't think, have enough palliative care physicians to really cover um, the entire uh, enterprise, particularly given the fact that we're facing the largest demographic shift in history uh, in this country. And in just 14 years, 20% of our population is going to be older than 65. And parenthetically, three quarters of all deaths occur in people who are greater than 65, even though I've given you the important notice that people can die anywhere during the life journey, any of us, any single one of us. So combining palliative care um, and connecting that as appropriate to hospice care um, and making sure that this is available for those who need it in a seamless way is extraordinarily important. So I think that that makes sense, but here's a dissonance that is quite shocking. And uh, I know that you know this, and I heard a little bit about this this morning in one of the sessions. There remains an enormous disparity between what professionals want for themselves and what they give um, to the patients they're caring for. Now, let me start by saying, when I talk about healthcare providers, I'm not just talking about doctors. In fact, I think we should be talking less about physicians and more about other members of the healthcare provider team, nurses, social work, clergy, and others who can complement and enhance supportive end-of-life um, planning. But if you look at the data that have been done, and these have been accrued in serial studies um, at institutions like Johns Hopkins um, decades ago and more recently in surveys, about 85% of physicians make it very clear that when they reach their end-of-life decisions, they do not want to be in the hospital or the intensive care facility. They want to be, if they can be, at home receiving supportive care. So here's the dissonance. Um, look at what happens. In this city of Los Angeles, it wasn't too long ago that one of the major medical centers used to advertise that if you come to our ICU, we won't let you die. What an amazing statement, right? I mean, that is, if you will, arrogance to the end belief. And it's not very caring either. Right? We should be honoring the right of people to choose when they're going to die in meaningful ways. And yet, only about a third of people, non-physicians, actually get what they want, even though when you survey them, and I bet if we surveyed this room, 85, 90% are very clear that they don't want life support systems at the end of life. So that's a very important dissonance, and it's something that we all need to be paying attention to. So that's recommendation one. Recommendation two is in order to understand what people want, you have to ask them. And um, this is something that you can't just take for granted. Uh, we can't assume that if someone goes to see their healthcare provider at any stage of their life, that there are going to be a discussion about end-of-life planning. And parenthetically, a really critical part of the IOM's work was to recognize that end-of-life discussions is not something that just takes place within months or days of death. In fact, with relatively rare areas, you can't predict when death is going to happen. You know, I think if you're diagnosed with most cancers, it's very unclear when that's going to happen. There maybe is one exception, and I don't want to overstate it because there are always exceptions, but there are some malignancies like pancreatic cancer that are just more severe at this juncture. That may change in the future. But for most disorders, cardiovascular disease, congestive heart failure, neurological deterioration, we can tell 
when death is going to take place. So we need to have discussions about what your preferences are through the life cycle, beginning when you're young and carried over throughout life. You know, it should start when you're in school. There should be discussions about that. And I'm not talking about medical school. I'm talking about perhaps high school, college. It should happen when you get a driver's license or when you form a significant relationship, when you start a new job, take on new responsibilities. And of course, it should happen at different punctuation points in the life cycle, especially if there's an illness or when you cross the age um, and you become eligible for Medicare. But it doesn't right now. Um, and oftentimes what takes place is these dialogues occur when there's desperation and therefore not really clear thinking decision making um, taking place. So we recommended that we can't leave it to healthcare providers alone to decide that they're going to do it because in point of fact they don't. This is a real tragedy. I mean in my own specialty of oncology, the majority of oncologists are neither trained nor able to have end-of-life discussions in meaningful ways, right? And that's true in other medical specialties as well. So we called on professional societies and related organizations to come up with criteria for both determining the metrics and outcomes for having end-of-life conversations and for coming up with the enforcements to make sure that they take place. Um, during uh, the care of individuals. So that was the second major recommendation. The third was you could codify all that you want in terms of the need for conversations, but if you don't have a healthcare community that's been adequately prepared and trained to have those conversations, they're not going to happen very effectively. And this is a real tragedy of American medicine. We've lost the connection with people We've lost the ability to really reach out and form a human bond. Um, we have become too digitized, too removed, too aloof to the process. Um, and that is a really sad state of events. So we recommended that there need to be wide sweeping changes in what educational entities um, are accounted for to do in terms of their accreditation, their certification, in making sure that education happens, not just, for example, in medical school or nursing school or school for social work or the like, but throughout the career path. Um, because the experience of early education, when it's abstract and removed from direct contact, can be enriched if you're making sure that there's continued dialogue throughout that life course. So assuring that this takes place and putting teeth around it so that if you don't get certified, you can't practice nursing or medicine is one way of really guaranteeing that the right number, that individuals will be prepared in the right way and will give it the right level of meaningful outcome. The fourth recommendation, not surprisingly, was about the need to change policies um, to enable the process of better end-of-life care to, to go forward. And here, you know, we recognize that some things could be done without the need for legislation, but we should embrace legislation if that is required. So one of the things that we felt important was that there be a change in the need for how Medicare perceives 911 events. Right now, if you're a Medicare patient, and um, C through CMS, the rules are, you know, if you have a crisis, you're going to be in an ambulance going to an emergency department. That's not the best way to make sure that we're providing state-of-the-art care. So we need to think about that. When we began our discussions, as Leonard uh, well remembers, um, we advocated for the payment to physicians um, for having end-of-life conversations uh, when patients crossed the age of 65 and became eligible for Medicare, recognizing that in 2010, just before the ACA was being uh, put forward, because it became too politically um, hot, you know, given the death panel discussion, it was pulled off the table. And we felt that that was not a good decision. And so we advocated strongly that that be considered. Um, and thankfully, 
just this past year that's been embraced and CMS is now moving forward. And I think that's one example of where even this report has already had some impact. We also felt that it was important to make sure that as we think about the days of electronic medical records, that there be interoperability and availability and accessibility of making your wishes as you've defined them known and available to your providers. I'll give you this vignette. Just a couple of years ago, I sort of escaped my life without ever having sort of a med medical intervention. But um, as Leonard may remember, when we were starting the IOM committee, I was in a period of incredible neuropathic pain. It actually followed my work on the Pain in America um, committee. And I required pretty major surgery. And um, thankfully, it was effective. But I went to that surgery with my advanced directives in hand. I brought them in my preoperative uh, meeting and then on the morning of surgery, I arrived in the hospital and said, you've got my advanced directives, right? No, they weren't there. This is, by the way, Stanford Hospital. Um, I was dean of the medical school. They were lost. Maybe this was part of the intent. If you're a dean, people would like to see you uh, disappear. But I you know, witnessed the reality that for many people today, because we don't have the right technical systems in place, it's too easy for these things to be, be lost. So um, changes in policy become really uh, important. And then our fifth recommendation, which is really part of what we're doing today, is to change the public dialogue, to really engage the community um, in discussions about death and dying. And I think there's been some amazing um, things that have happened um, over the course of our time together. We didn't anticipate that when our report was coming out, out that Atul Gawande was going to be um, publishing um, Being Mortal, you know, or that Paul Calathini was going to face a life-threatening challenge that led to When Breath Becomes Air. Um, but we know that these books have become very popular, that people want to read them and understand them. Someone asked me recently, why don't Americans want to talk about death and dying? And I said, I don't think that they don't want to talk about it. I don't think that people are engaging them appropriately, creating the right settings for these dialogues to happen. And that's part of the public discourse. Now, I'll just end by saying that many IOM reports, I dare to say, are completed, sit on a shelf, and don't really have effective outcomes. Because there was an anonymous donor for this report, there was additional money left for promoting and looking at implementation of the report over time. And the National Academy of Medicine um, has now had two and, and three events that will carry this dialogue forward. One was um, just within a year. In March of 2015, there was kind of a national stakeholders meeting with every constituency tied and mapped to one of these five areas that I described to you, brought um, into DC for a community meeting to say, what are you going to do to implement these recommendations? And I would say that in many cases, it's become quite actively engaged and very positively so. Um, the second is that we had a follow-up to that um, just this last June in 2016 with continued dialogue and discussion. And this meeting today that you're all at is just another um, point of evidence that there is an eagerness to continue moving this agenda forward. And then Leonard is chairing a national roundtable um, that will go on for the next two and a half years um, that will continue this dialogue through uh, the National Academy. There's a lot of work to be done a lot of work to be done, but I do think now that there is evidence of progress taking place um, and that you are very much part of that progress. You have that important role because in some ways each of you in your own jobs, your roles are going to influence the outcomes of others, but individually we each together have the reality that it's going to affect us at some point. We don't know when but it inevitably will. So doing this work is all the more important. Thank you very much.